I'm Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government. And I have with me today one of the neatest guys you're ever going to meet, Charlie Miranda. He's District 6, Tampa City Council. Charlie, so happy to have you back on the show. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm honored to be here with you, Bill. I, you know, there, there are a number of things that you know about. And generally, when I have you on, we talk an awful lot about plumbing. Because I think you probably know more about the pipes in Tampa <laughs> than anybody else in the entire world. Well, thank you very much, but uh, plumbing today will be discussed. Uh, whatever you want to talk about, that's what we're here for, and I know you certainly have some questions that you'd like to ask of me, and I hope I can answer them. I'm going to ask you some things today, and basically because I have a personal interest in this particular area. As I look back across Tampa's history, and I've only lived here since 99, but I've gone to a lot of the exhibits and different things, and I see that we had a fabulous relationship for hundreds of years with the country of Cuba. That we have the Ybor section, which had a lot of Cuban immigrants in it. And I watch today, we're starting to see airplanes flying out of here directly to Cuba. And you, your, your relatives came from there. Your father came from there, I believe. My father came from there. You've been back and forth a number of times. So I'd like your ideas on what Tampa can do now and into the future to cement a relationship with this beautiful little country 90 miles off our shore. Let me say this. From all things that I've seen and things that I've listened from the Cuban people, uh, they have a wonderful memory of Tampa. Why? Because you got to understand that when the cigar makers came here in the turn of the century, from the 1800s to the 1900s, and tobacco and things of that nature, cigar makers is what made Ybor City and actually started the blossoming of the city of Tampa, they were mostly Cubans. And those ancestors stayed here, and, but they also had family there. So it was always a take, give and take between two countries for over 110, 20 years. What happened is, even then after, when baseball got popular between the two countries, Cuba was playing in the Florida State League, and guess what? They were called the Cuban Hurricanes. We were the Tampa Smokers. <laughs> and uh, Miami had the Sun Sox. Uh, Miami Beach had the Flamingos. And those are the things that I remember growing up. And I went to Cuba back in 1954 with a great team of guys that I don't even know how I made the team, but uh, the shortstop was a gentleman by the name of Tony La Russa, and he gets installed into the Baseball Hall of Fame in July. So we were the first little league team. Oh, great. And you were on that team with I was, him. Well, I didn't say I was good. I said I was on the <laughs> team. I didn't say I played well. But uh, we were Just there. Just making the team was a good thing. I was lucky to get there. And that's another story for another day. But uh, every time I go, and I've been since 54 to present, see family and understand what, what, what happened. I don't think anybody really knows what happened. I can tell you that the Cuban people are kind, gracious, and love the United States, and especially Tampa. There is no doubt in my mind that Tampa, with a little effort, would be the preferred port and the first port stopping area for anyone from that Caribbean country to come visit America. It is a love relationship that they've had for over 100 years and they haven't forgotten that. On the other side of that, why? Because it started back a hundred and some years ago. When you look at the other part, the largest concentration of Cubans are in Miami, but they have a different relationship. Even though there's embargoes, people from this country send their relatives in Cuba over a billion dollars a year to keep them going because of low wages and economic problems that those individuals or family members have. And I'm happy that they're doing that. You uh, said there was a, a different relationship just a minute ago between the Cuban community here and Cuba and the Cuban community in Miami and Cuba. Well, I'll explain that. That time that my father and those came at the turn of the 1800s or the 1900s, they came from one thing only, opportunity not only for them, but for the future family members. Those that came in the 60s, 70s, and 80 either came because they felt oppression and they had to go and then find the economic opportunity or the Marielle boat lift. So there's a different philosophy as to why they came. 
Those that left early left because they wanted to leave, not because they had to leave or they felt they had to leave. And that's what happened. So there's Those, still an anger built up. Oh, there's the got to be. And, and you got to understand both sides. These that moved uh, to South Florida had lost a lot. Some were jailed, some were in prison, some were under conditions, and uh, some left because they took their house away or were taking their business away, and they felt the pressure and left. These that came when my father came never had anything. So they left, and when they arrived, they had the same thing that when they left, nothing. But they had an opportunity to better themselves and their family when they, they had a family. So there's two differences here. The people of Cuba always have had a romance with the people of Tampa. They love us. And uh, we've never had a problem with them. I can understand the problem of South Florida, but that's a problem that's uh, very difficult uh, to unravel. With our big port facility here, that would seem to be a, another wonderful opportunity. We do a lot of business with Costa Rica, places like that, but they're even closer. It's only going to get bigger and better. And Cuba is building a port for the huge super ships that go into Mariel that we can't even bring to Tampa because the Skyway Bridge yeah. is not tall enough. So well, I they, thought it was when they well, built it. It was very tall, but now the sails have gotten taller. <laughs> you know how that goes. And, and it's happening that uh, Cuba is going to be a distribution point where you unload and load for smaller ships and leave wherever you want to go to. So Cubans are thinking. They're very aggressive. They do things that I don't know. I, can, I don't think I'd be able to do. I don't think I can keep a 1950 car moving uh, with a different engine, changing the transmission, finding parts that they don't make or you can't buy them, and, and diff things of all nature. Uh, they do without but they know how to live. With the people here, if I wanted to go or anyone decided, you, you go to Cuba on a regular basis. You oh, not a regular basis, but I, I go, I visit my family and but you, you I go with, with the, different you things. The baseball team down there? Well, I, I didn't go in 2011 because I had the two major surgeries right. and I was in camp. And by the way, talking about that baseball team, from 54 to now, we played 10 times with the Cubans. Let me tell you that Cuba's won five and Tampa's won five. <laughs> Is that so right? now I don't know where, I don't think we got it in us anymore unless we're going wheelchairs to play them. But they, they're I great. think you had a few substitutes or ringers coming along well, with you, didn't you? Uh, we didn't, they did. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why we lost, uh, I, I can remember 54, we were all, you know, from nine to 13, and I never seen 13 year olds with a mustache and a beard, but I guess you can grow in the southern part of the hemisphere and get your beard grows quicker. Not to say that they're older, I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the sun bakes it on you, you know, uh, things of that nature. But uh, University of Tampa went down in January, and uh, they beat top of Cuba's top three teams. And let me tell you about that team. That team now has played 44 games here in their conference and out of conference in the United States. The at University of Tampa University team? of Tampa. And they've won 42 out of 44. That's, wow. That's in baseball, pretty... that's very difficult yeah. to do. And uh, more likely, uh, hopefully, they have an opportunity to repeat as uh, Division II baseball champs. What if someone from here wanted to go to Cuba today? I, I, let's say myself. I, in right. fact, I would, I'd love to go to Cuba today. I'd like to spend a week there or whatever time, mostly in the countryside. I'd like that. Havana would be all right, but I'd really like to see There's the individuals people. that have what is called a people-to-people -people license that you meet up with them, they put a group together, and it's just for that, for the exchange of idealism and what exchanges uh, those people have in mind that you can show them where you come from, they talk to you, and you visit certain places in the island, and uh, you have a tour guide that goes with you, and it'd be beneficial for both countries to continue that going on, because uh, no one goes down there to take anything, and I don't want you, they just feel the welcoming you and anybody else that goes on that tour. So there is a people-to-people -people license. They charge you a little bit more How to go. How would you find? They, you like call that? one of the travel agencies oh, okay. and, uh, that, that have the airline, ABC or Island Travel or two, there's a couple other airlines. And they will tell you uh, who and how you can go and make those arrangements for you. I'm not qualified to tell you that because I don't, I don't travel like that. I would love to go down there. And, and actually, I, I have both an American and Canadian passport, so I could probably jump on a plane and go with the Canadian passport. 
Do you have to get a visa to go there? You have to get a visa to go there, and the visas are between 60 to to $100, depending on the availability of them. And you also, when you go with American dollars, you can't spend an American dollar. You gotta go turn it in, convert it to a CUC. That's a Cuban make-up dollar, and then you got the peso. So now you got three currencies going on at one time. You have to turn that in at the airport. You can't change it. So they flip it. you for 10% on, on it that. It used roughly. to be 20, and they changed it a couple of years ago to 10. Okay. So they're making 10% on whatever money you take to spend, and you can only take so much according to the U.S. laws. They got me going into China similarly. It wasn't quite that much, but they got me. Well, at least you got to travel to China. I didn't. And then you, when you're leaving, you got to pay a 25 CUC exit uh, ticket that they give you, and they stamp it onto your visa so you can board the plane. Oh, okay. So they charge you $25 to leave. Per person. Per person. Okay. And 10% uh, of the exchange of money. And then you get these UCCs, is that what you said? CUCs. CUCs. And then you have to take them somewhere and change them to pay On the way back. If you want to change them, you change them. But if you plan on leaving in the next two or three years, you got, it costs you usually twenty-five, thirty dollars to get from the airport to wherever you're going to stay at the hotel or whatever. And there's, you know, I would advise you to stay with twenty or thirty dollars. You, you were saying that a doctor in Cuba earns about eighteen to forty-five dollars a month. From what I've talked to doctors in Cuba, that's their salary: eighteen dollars to forty-five dollars. The eighteen dollars is a general practitioner or someone who's starting off that does the basic examinations. The high-end $45 are the ones that do surgery. So, and, and if I wanted to stay in a hotel, I'd be looking at $100 to $150 a I day? would think in any three to five-star hotel, that's the going rate. You can stay in what they call casa particular that are registered with the government, that they pay so much every month, whether they rent or don't rent, as I'm told. But you can find a house, a, a very nice house, for about $40 to $45. Uh, a day where you and your wife could stay. You have a room, an air-conditioned room, and a bath, uh, bathroom. And uh, then the most costly thing in Cuba is when you hire a taxi or a personal driver to take you around. They run from 60 to 100 bucks a day. Really? Yeah. But they and, take you anywhere you want. But they probably don't get to keep much of that. Well, it depends. It depends on what they are. Uh, some are private contractors, and they pay so much to have the license to do that. But if you hire a taxi, they, taxis run by the government. Well, I'd sure love to see us develop an even greater relationship with Cuba, just from the city of Tampa, that make it just fabulous, just to be sort of like a sister city again and see it develop the way that I think it can develop, because if, things are going to loosen up. Bill, if that was put on the ballot today in Florida, I think it passed. It was put on the ballot in Hillsborough County. It passed 90 to 10. Oh, without a doubt. It, there's no doubt in my mind. And I think it's time for the U.S. government uh, to make a commitment to the people of the United States that if they want to go visit, all it takes is a presidential signature that says that all, any American can travel. I can travel anywhere I want. The whole world here can travel anywhere they want, but they can't travel to Cuba. Uh, that's a shame. And uh, I'm not saying they've got to lift the embargo. Let the people talk to the people. Go. I, let the Americans go. I think they're fearful of the fact that if they go, they're going to come back and say, what's the embargo about? I, I Charlie, I couldn't argue with you on that. I, I'm still astounded. We fought a war in Vietnam. 50,000 of our kids were killed. We have many, many more times that that are injured and will be disabled the rest of their lives. And yet today, Vietnam gets most favored nation status. They still have the same communist government. Nothing's changed. Well, you and I and don't play. And we're beating up against the 90, uh, it, it makes no sense It's about the people, not about the government. You got to help everybody worldwide. We live in a very small, and getting smaller every day because of technology and forms of transportation. We got to understand the people. And there's where I think we falter a little bit because look at Central and South America. Look at the countries that are now thinking the other way. Venezuela, Colombia, Bolivia. Why? We don't pay attention to them. As chairman of the city council, and that's a big job, what are some of the things, switching a little bit, what are some of the things you think are most important to the city of Tampa right now? 
that's just one thing that was near and dear to my heart, and I wanted to talk with you and hear your thought of. But what about some of the other things that are extremely important to our growth and to the viability of the city? We are prepared for growth in the city like no other city south of Atlanta. Let me explain why. We have a water department that has the capability of producing the water that we need and the resources to have it to produce. And we have a two-share retreatment plant that does about 60 million gallons a day but was designed for 95 million 25 years ago. So we can enhance it by one-third more and have, we don't have to ask the taxpayers for a nickel. We have the system in place. We're prepared for the growth to come. There's no doubt in my mind that Mayor Buckhorn and predecessor to him, Arovio, Greco, Poe, Martinez, Friedman, all them did an outstanding job. And when you go back, I've never worked with a mayor ever that's ever done anything but to try to be the best mayor they can for the citizens of this city. And I'll say that anywhere. I think they were all great people, wonderful people, have different ideas. Everybody's got a personality. Everybody's got a genetic makeup. True. But the goal was to get the best thing does for all the citizens of this area. And I think it's coming. And I think Tampa better prepare itself. Tampa will be a large city. We're about 350,000. With a blink of an eye, we'll go to 450. And traffic is a main problem. Uh, it used to be my wife well, and I. I agree with that. Well, here's the thing. Here's why. It used to be just my wife and I with two cars. That is my wife and I and three kids. Now you got five cars. <laughs> five cars. Now my wife in here, but I'm here. I got the three kids, and they got five kids that are driving out of the eight grandchildren. So what do you got? Within ourselves, we multiplied it four foes. And that's what's happening. Traffic is here because the young people that were here are now 18 to 21, and they all got a car, and they're all driving. Not to mention the influx that's coming. So we must have the availability of water, the availability to clean that water in the two sherry treatment plant, and the availability to fix the intersection to allow traffic to move. There is no doubt in my mind that we need mass transit. It's very now, hard to pass. Before we leave water, I think you were telling me that one of the things that you worked on very early, and it's an ongoing program, is replacing the sewer lines and water lines here in the city. Is that That is still correct? going on. Uh, that's now under Mike Suarez, the chairman of public work, and he's doing an outstanding job, believe me. And at one time, we were doing 10 miles a year replacement because we're a 100-year-old city. And then we went to 50 when times were good. We had to cut back to 10 because we didn't have the revenue, 10 miles a year. And that's just barely catching up. Doesn't I was going to say, that sounds like a lot, but didn't you say that we, our sewer line would stretch all the way to Washington, D.C.? Or go to New York and back, because we got 2,500 miles of water lines. And at 10 miles, 10 It'll miles a year. never finish, because every, every 10 years, by the time you do 100, you got another 100 that became 60, 70 years old. So it's a catch up, just like a leaky roof. You can't patch it. You got to replace it all. Wow. So let's talk about transportation. Uh, that's near and dear to my heart also, because I, I honestly, I live down in Sun City Center, and I love the city of Tampa. Any of you who heard me speak of it before, I think this is a fabulous city, and I love being part of it. But I don't come downtown any time during business hours. Well, I'm glad you're saying those things. First of all, Sun City is very, a very wonderful part of Hillsborough County. It's not in the city of Tampa, as you mentioned, but it's got one of the highest voting precincts and people that vote know what's going on. People that don't vote, it's not that they don't care, they don't know how to care. And you individuals that live in Sun City are wonderful people. You understand. They do vote. Oh yeah, and you do vote. And, and we, we appreciate that you do. One thing about it, you can't vote against me because you don't live in the city. <laughs> right. So I can say all this without saying I'm mustering you up. Well, I'd vote I, for you, Charlie. I, well, if thank I was you there. very much. But I'm just trying to tell you that uh, we love what you do and what you stand for, and you do things uh, you got the golf cart capital of the world. Everybody's got a cart, and that's wonderful. It's beautiful. I drive by there once in a while. I stop, and I watch, and I go around your golf course, and I look, and all that kind of stuff, and I really enjoy it. Well, you come out there, and I'll give you a personal tour. All right. I promise I will, but it's, uh, you know, this whole area, Hillsborough County in the next 20 years is going to increase by over 400,000 people, so we better be prepared, and we're making those plans as we go along. So when they keep coming in, we're prepared. I can't build a fence around the city or Hillsborough County, nor do I want to. 
because the more people come in, taxes are spread out. If they don't come in, taxes got to go up to pay for the infrastructure that you're trying to replace. But we moved here in 99. I run an international company that does training for all different kinds of management subjects. And I needed an airport. When we moved to Florida, I looked at Miami, I looked at all these other airports, and this is the most civilized airport in the world. I think. And we moved down into Apollo Beach when we first got here, and then I realized that I had to schedule airline flights that weren't anywhere near the center of the day because getting from my house to the airport was a real challenge. So I started scheduling night and early flights and things of that nature. And we do need some kind of decent transit. If I want to go from Sun City Center in and I want somebody to drive me. One hour. Oh, easy, depending on the time of day. Plus, I'm going to pay anywhere from 40 to $60 for somebody to drive me to the airport. Well, call me. I do it for 30 <laughs> But uh, as a friend. All right. You, you're on tape with that, by uh, the way. All right. Isn't there some kind of problem we've got now going with the taxi cabs? Or well, something? I'm not in that area, but it's, it's, uh, I understand the pros and the cons of it, and uh, it depends on what side you're on. But uh, there is no better place to live, like you talked about the airport. Just think of that it's airport. It's the most civilized it, airport it, but in the world. It's not, it wasn't built yesterday. That airport's 40, 50 years old. And look at the, you look at it, you think it's brand new because it was done with the idea of what was going to happen. You get on a tram, you go to the air side that you're in, and there's four or five airlines or, and four or five on this side. And then when you get off, you get on that, go back. You don't hardly walk. Everything is civilized. You go to any other major airport, you go to Houston or Dallas or Atlanta or Miami. By the time you finish walking, you're in shape to play a football game. <laughs> that, that, that far, that long. I, I've done it in all of those airports. Well, you're the guy that I see as number 63, huh? Yeah, all over the place. But uh, like I was saying, it's a, an area that is prime, and it just, we have the opportunity to serve the people, and we got great people living here. Uh, yes, the complaints that I get mostly are about speed bumps, about this is too close to my house, the noise, the dog barking. I get the, Mary gets them all. I hear only a, a tenth of them. Oh, by the way, but Mary is a jewel. Your assistant is just absolutely a fantastic lady. Well, don't tell me that because you're going to ask me for a raise. And, <laughs> and she's in the third floor, so I'll send her to the fourth floor and tell her she got a raise. But uh, she's a wonderful person, does a lot of work for the city, got a great heart. And uh, without her, I'd, I'd, it'd be hard to replace her. Oh, it'd be, it'd be impossible. In fact, a lot of the staff there, though, in the, co the commission are all really very great people. We have great Council. staff members. and. Uh, they don't realize it, but for instance, I can tell you that my office is average over 150 emails a day. She handles 150 emails a day. A day. She handles not only that; she handles the phone in the office. She handles uh, people that complain, things that I have to do, where I got to be, what I got to do, and uh, like I said, uh, it's it's hard to do what we do, and, but we love it. How do you stand on light rail? You mentioned it a minute ago. What, what do you think that light rail can play a part here in the city? I think first you've got to start with an area that has natural ingress and egress of point A to point B okay. and back and return. Right. Like, you know, New Tampa, downtown, or downtown to St. Pete, back and forth. You have to show the public that those rails, the trains, are full or near full. You can't have empty seats because the public will turn against you on what you want to do somewhere else. Transportation does not pay for itself. Well, neither do roads, though. Neither do roads. And people get so wound up on it. Well, oh, I don't want to pay for that. There's empty seats. Well, I, sh I can show you some empty roads, too. Uh, you can, and you can see. I, I With potholes in them. Well, don't say that, because Mario <laughs> gets complaints now. We've got to fill them up. And, and let me tell well, you these what, were in the county. Let me, let me say this about these potholes. Within 48 hours, Every pothole that Mary's turned in that I know of, the city goes out and fixes them. So they have a great She's got program. some clout. Well, she must have the clout <laughs> because I don't, but she calls and it gets done. I call, it takes two weeks. She calls, it's a couple of days. But these are the things that I'm saying that we try to maintain what we can, and the public's got to understand that's like 54 miles of city roads that don't belong to the city. 
They're either county or state roads. And it's hard for us to do those oh, things. Oh, really? Yeah. We have to ask permission. And usually they do it, but sometimes they give us the right to go fix the road. How about cooperation with the city county or with the uh, county? The county. I have seen a great improvement over the years between these commissioners and the council members. I think we get along. I think we have uh, the right uh, ingredient. I call it the vegetable soup. We're just all in it to make something look and get better for all citizens. And uh, I have no problem in, with any county commissioner that I've ever worked with in the last four years that uh, has been in any way but complimentary to the city of Tampa. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd particularly like to say to the public? No, just uh, thanks to individuals like you who give the opportunity to elected officials like me to come on and, and sit on your show and discuss whatever the hot topics are for the day. Uh, we certainly welcome that opportunity and you do an outstanding public service and we honor you for that. TVCN is very, very grateful to the people of Tampa to help us stay on the air and to the commission and to the mayor because without you it would be very hard to do. Well, this we is the only public access television station still on the air in the state of Florida. Well, because individuals like yourself and people that run this show and people that come on your show, they know that you are a respectable individual and you do things not for yourself but for your community. Well, the nice thing about this show is I don't have to make ratings. I don't have to be a snipe. I don't have to sit and wait and catch you in something. I'm just here to let you say what you need to say to the public. And that's why we continue to come. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much for being with us. Charlie, you're a great guest. Thank I thank you for being here. You're unique, you're special, you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know. We'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government.